colder. Moment of spicing this. In Copenhagen, Denmark. 120 world leaders cooped up inside one building. Negotiations continue with maximum chaos. Uh, Mohammed Nasheed, the president of the Maldives. Do you see any signs of progress? That big meeting going on in Copenhagen. If there's going to be a deal on how to save the planet, it's got to happen soon. Other world leaders holding some closed door talks, and they're really trying to work out some type of last minute agreement. And it's proving to be a little bit more difficult. There's finger pointing going around. There's talk about whether or not they're going to leave with anything concrete. We deal with the systemic risk, which is what climate change poses to the world economy. How much attention? The negotiators are still unable to come up with a text. So let's keep our fingers crossed. We can still come out with a deal. Thank you. How climate change is affecting your country? Well, our Maldives is just 1.5 meters above sea level. And because of climate change and sea level rise, the number of our islands are eroding. And it's not something in the future. It is something that we are facing right now. Thank you. I think I have to go. The Maldives is a stretch of 2,000 tiny islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean. It's a very low-lying country. We do not have even one hill. I've traveled the country up and down many, many times. Even if you live all your life here, you can't fail to be impressed. Historical evidence suggests that people were living here for thousands of years in equilibrium with the sea. But things are changing world is getting hotter. The sea level is rising. The ability to sustain human life here is very fragile. If we can't stop the sea is rising, global warming will destroy the mountains. As a president, it is very clear to me that the most important fight is the fight for our survival. Me <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Come on, Bram. 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 In many eyes, the Maldives is a place to go on holiday. Where the very rich and famous come and relax. This is the height of the good life. It's, uh, you know, a cross between paradise and paradise. The beautiful ocean, the golden beaches, extremely high class hotels and resorts. But most people don't know the history of the Maldives for the last 30 years. Ironically, it is exactly on these same beaches that most of the torture took place. I've seen people hanging upside down with coconut honey thrown on them so that the ants come and eat them. I've seen people buried in the ground no? And kept for days and days in rain and sun. I have seen it with my own eyes because I was there for five years. This is the truth of Gayul's regime. Gayum ruled for 30 years. There was no opposition, there were no political parties, there was no freedom of expression, there was no freedom of assembly. The island chiefs, they would insist that there isn't a single ballot which said no to, to Gayum. The man got, you know, over 90%, 99% in, in, in most cases. Uh, and that's, that's incredible. I mean, even God himself doesn't get 99% uh, approval. He was like a, he was a mafia don. In the first three months of his presidency, he arrested more than 480 political prisoners. It was just crazy, you know. When we were growing up, the word for president was automatically Maumoon, and no one else, no question about it. We weren't taught about the past presidents. It was just Maumoon who brought the education. It was Maumoon who brought tourism into the country. And that's it. I went to school in England. In 89, after graduation, um, I came back to the Maldives. By this time, the state had become more and more repressive. So we decided that it, it would be good to come up with a magazine. Nasheed uh, and I and a few others began um, a publication uh, called Sangu, which was a political uh, publication. It was talking about two things, corruption and human rights abuse. It was very critical of the regime. One night at about three in the morning, they came to my uh, house. They raided my home uh, and took a whole lot of papers. They came and they took him away. It was in the middle of the night. I mean, you are, uh, we had heard so many stories of what they were doing in the jails and all that. Uh, so it was terrifying in a way, really. I, I, I refused to give a confession. So, because of this, I was taken to a corrugated iron sheet cell. The whole cell is um, five feet by three feet. Uh, you had a mat. That's all.
you can still have a schedule for the day, even if you can't move. You could go for a uh, walk. In your mind, you could be walking. If you can walk, if you're not um, chained, you take four or five steps in, in the cell, but you could do it millions of times. You take uh, every second as it comes. I mean, 18 months was a fairly long time in solitary. When I was released, I was very politically motivated. So I dedicated my time in trying to introduce democracy to bring people to power. I wanted to form a political party. With a child, I didn't like that at all. But I didn't have much choice. I could have left him, I guess, but he would still have done it. In the last 20 years, I've been arrested 12 times. Um, I've been tortured twice. My second child was born while I was in confinement. I was brought um, early in the morning to the hospital and Lila had given birth the night before. Um, I was shown Zaya just once. Um, I, I picked her up and, uh, um, and then I was taken back again. In September 2003, a young boy uh, was tortured and beaten to death in jail. There had been rumors of people being murdered in jail for years. Normally they hush everything up, but this was unusual. The mother had been brave enough to insist that the son not be buried without everyone seeing him. So the body had been left in the cemetery for public viewing from his head to his toes. There weren't any bit that wasn't damaged or bruised or... I mean, you could kill somebody, but here you could see that he was really tortured to death. I've seen it many times, the beatings. I felt the beatings many times. I know how you would feel when you have, you know, when, when, when death is just right around the corner. When people saw what had happened to the body, that really triggered the democracy movement. That was the turning point. That was the turning point. There was rioting in the Maldives. I received a call from a friend of mine in the Maldives. And this person was sort of clearly running down the street. You know, you could hear the thud, thud, thud of the foot, footsteps over the phone. And it's like, oh, I've just, I've just punched a National Security Service officer. People rampage through town, smashing anything that symbolizes state. So police cars were torched. That's when the government had to announce a state of emergency and control that unrest. We were scared. Tanks had been brought out. We were all wondering what more could happen. I was very afraid for my life. After having understood what they've done to that boy, I knew that they must do the same to me. They must, if they were to survive and if they were to go on. So, this time, as soon as I was released, I left. I went into exile. President Gayoum has ruled almost unchallenged since 1978. People that I've spoken to uh, in the Maldives are frightened to talk to me openly. It's not true. But they, they are. I assure you that's not true. Well, you're, you're telling me I'm, I'm lying. Not, I'm not saying you are lying, but you, have, you are not well informed. We've been working abroad for quite some time by this time, but still it was possible for us to be very, very tightly organized. Yeah. 
and therefore we were able to exert a fair amount of pressure on the regime. And then in the middle of all this, the tsunami hit. In 2004, the tsunami destroyed much of the Maldives. Entire islands were abandoned. The tsunami brought a lot of climate issues home. It was a very strong reminder of the fragility of human life here. The tsunami wiped out by over 50% of GDP in an hour. So the regime really needed money. And the Europeans in particular so said, well, we'll give you $100 million that was linked to political reform. Gayum, he would only relent as much as he had to at any certain point, but never actually delivered any substantial change. We had set up the Maldivian Democratic Party abroad, but we had to move forward. There was no way that we could establish the party in the Maldives without me going there and taking the risks. We had all thought it was a very bad mistake to come back, that he would be arrested right at the airport. had to get the reform movement going out on the streets of course we were peaceful but we had to really put pressure on Gayum. when this movement started i knew that nasheed would be either murdered by Gayum or he would be the president of maldives these were acts of defiance and and it's like baits and, and Gayum, um, you know, we got him. The Maldives was looking very much like an occupied country. I would be lying if I tell you that I wasn't afraid. But Ani keeps telling us all the time, you know, you must get courage from each other. So stand by together. Demonstrations were taking place all throughout the country. There were huge demonstrations in Paris Mathoda, Tinadu, Kimbidu, Ukros, and you know, many, many, many islands. This was spreading like wildfire. It just finally came to a point that Gayum had to relent and he had to allow free and fair elections. All my friends were talking about democracy, they were debating about it, graffiti on walls, vote, democracy, no for Maumoon, yes for Anni, and I said, like, wow, things have changed here. We took some opinion polls and we saw Gayum being the winner. And he was somewhere in the third, I think. But, and he said to me, look, there's still time. We, we, we still have to run the campaign. We will have to reach out to the people. We went into almost every single household, more than 52,000 homes. Even the most hardened of regime loyalists in the islands. They would listen. The president says he needs another term to see through his democratic reforms. <laughs> um, well, he's already had 30 years and we, we really quite can't see how uh, and what else he's going to do with another five years. Gayum was so sure he was going to win it. He even ordered um, enough fireworks to celebrate it. 
I was on my island uh, trying to get as many votes from there as possible. We were putting live updates on the Minivanis website. I was sitting in a 18th century pub in Glencoe in Scotland. The results start coming around 8 in the evening, I think. And the sheep was 10% ahead of me. And I thought, you know, that's a sizable lead. By around 9 p.m., we were so nervous and said, I think he's going to win. Ballot boxes after ballot boxes. And around 3 in the morning, uh, we were absolutely sure that this is going to happen. At 75% of the votes, the newspaper called the election. It was said, a win for Annie was a headline. And at that point, I fell off my stool. When the sun started to come, and people started to slowly um, gather in the surf point in Male. There's this really beautiful song, a very um, traditional old that goes way back. It's like, um, let's all join our hands and let's go as the nation wishes. The main feeling that day was that we had proved them wrong, that we were right all along and, you know, uh, that we believed in the right thing. That that moment, we knew that we had our country back. When we came to power, we thought we won the fight. After 20 years, uh, uh, we thought, look, okay, you know, we'll have a happy life. But we had our first few cabinet meetings, and most of the pending issues were climate change issues. Weather patterns are changing, and that's having a, a very big impact on fisheries. We have lost a lot of shoreline. Our islands are going to be flooded. Ultimately, <laughs> The construction industry, Harman Karia, and a concession holder and Neruga, Emiunkari, Hamavara Safko, again, we come by a cock and Tivaka, the Kenny, a Benskar, Gata, Ganefa, a Kabara, Haruga, Whiskey, Puri, and Haradkopa, Nuria, Koka, Harmaka, Fund, and Nukurani. They read Kokiad. Me, Hurumale, Eti, Hama, Emi, who you're to bande bande bande. Puriba, contract the Kaki, your ten bande. I am me, Gagana, come on, moon, they have Saraku, sir, Perigay. Then they have Hatega, so you go going at Jimmy or Nani Hama. Can't elegant keep a lot to it up. To it, who had to buy a high, who had to dress good. I was able to get a lot of people who were So, the position of the Maldives is what was it? Survival is non negotiable, right? Mm -hmm. That's the climate change position. So The reason why Maldives is unique is because we're going to lose an entire nation, an identity, yeah. culture, and all these things. So, yeah. That's because there are so many other countries. There's Netherlands, there's Nigeria, but none of these countries, they're going to lose their entire national identity. Mm -hmm. 
we will. The Maldives have been here for thousands of years mm -hmm. because the winds are moving back and forth. Mm -hmm. Now, what's happening, especially the last five years, mm -hmm. is the monsoon is shifting earlier. So on this corner, we've seen almost five meters of beachfront lost. Usually this monsoon, it should shift about um, April, May, right? Mm -hmm. It started shifting this year, first week of February. of the Maldives has announced this week that his country plans to be the first in the world to go carbon neutral, meeting all of its energy requirements through renewable sources such as solar and wind power. It hopes to complete the transition within a decade. Today, I can announce to you and the world that the Maldives will be the first carbon neutral country in the world. We hope to be and we have, we have planned to become carbon neutral in the next 10 years and we feel that we can achieve this. 
Paul, yeah. uh, what's the speech? What, what, what are we doing in England? You're doing a keynote speech in Parliament, so that gives you a, a, a big degree of leeway to, to, to almost say what, what you, whatever you want. You've got to play to what you feel natural doing. There's this photo in Sweden and you stood on the lectern kind of going like this, yeah. you know, and, and it was kind of having a conversation. So it's not this scripted speech, yeah. but it's sort of a series of, of anecdotes and, and points. Fundamentally, our main, main point is we do not go according with the pack. And that's well, why we, we, we talk about we, we, we talk about whatever has to be said. Okay. The other thing is um, we want to say uh, if you can't defend the Maldives today, yeah. you can't defend England tomorrow. Because if you can't save the Maldives, that means we've probably had about two degrees <laughs> of global warming. It's the domino warming. theory all over again. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, it's the Vietnam, and please come and defend Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't put it quite like that, but I get your point. Uh, oh. <laughs> Um, but even if you don't put it, I'm going to say it. <laughs> uh, oh, this makes me so nervous. I want to make a curse to be a full name, but they'll call the knee. Go down on it. We mean the Kung, I want me by the knee. Come who could do a hack. Radio Gizaria, the Bafu Naiko could have a good call. He had to call the waiter. Alhamdulillah, summarize the state of the science it would be that everything is worse than we originally thought sea level rise way outside what the models projected it's much much higher and this this is the real key one here that these are global emissions and the worst case scenario was this red line and you can see 2005 2006 2007 are above the red line so again in terms of the drivers for climate change and sea level rise we're way outside what anyone expected and most of that's China and India so all of this time that we spend talking and all of these meetings we have at Copenhagen and everywhere else, the temperature is rising and I think people forget that. Um, so the worst case scenario in sea levels, if you take into account ice sheets and how, how oceans behave and so on, is two metres by 2100. Can you deal with that? No. No. Two metres we can't survive, no. Right. Uh, and with carbon dioxide levels at current, le you know, 387 parts per million, Eventually, we'll see 25 metres of sea level rise. The only, the only way to get the situation turned around is to get CO2 down again. We need to get back to 350 parts per million. So we've got to somehow remove the extra CO2 from the atmosphere. You know, this, this is the problem. We need to start talking about the solution. How do we actually get the carbon emissions down? No, but it's not rocket science, is it? I mean, if you mold these, you can do it in 10 years, 100%. Why is the rest of the world uh, desperately trying to avoid doing 10% in, you know, 30 years? Oh, well, no, 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 because many people um, in many governments wouldn't actually believe the science. They wouldn't believe this. They just simply, really? no. Mm -hmm. We need to just clear the table. You know, none of it is working. Mm -hmm. India and Brazil, they're not agreeing to it. So at Copenhagen, when the eyes of the world are on you, you've actually got to do something to, to really make that moment count. Yeah. So we need to get India, China and Brazil on our side. And the US. Mm. 
Uh, well, I mean, it's, they're the key drivers of emissions that you can expect. Indian politicians or Chinese or, or, or Brazilian politicians, they're not willing to uh, stop opening up power plants. They like cutting ribbons. Uh, politicians like that. Uh, and it's going to be very difficult asking them to stop that. But instead, if we ask them to cut more ribbons, green ribbons, green ribbons and, and more, more of it, twice more, then it, w it might work. Do you understand what I mean? Uh, Do you think it's workable? Yeah. Yeah, we just have to show them. I will go with it to the Indian government. And you can pick up the phone and speak to them? Yes, we, we can pick up the phone and speak to them. Go back. We don't finish. Alright. Maldives is a frontline state. If you thought defending Poland and defending Vietnam was important, defending the Maldives is very important. And when you have millions and billions of people in similar predicaments, just imagine the impact it would have on world order or security. We know that Maldives becoming carbon neutral is not going to stop us from annihilation. We know that. But at least we could die knowing that we've done the right thing. Yes, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Keep stressing. Yeah. 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 We are trying to see if, if we can qualify for a few programs. Yeah. Climate change issue is very important. And also democracy. Yes. And, and we will climate change in the context of democracy. Yeah. Without democracy, you cannot adapt. The former dictatorship wasted $200 million because they gave the contracts to the wrong people. There were so many governance issues. Yeah, I think in your peculiar circumstances where you formed a democracy out of something less pleasant, and you need a little bit of structural help, yes. seems to me that we, sh we should be helping. Supporting democracy in an Islamic country, mm. what, what's more important than that? I mean, that's a fair summary, isn't it? It's a, it's a very, very fair summary. And also, we, we want to see if we can have a better relationship with one of the oppositions in some of the Arab countries uh, uh, and see if they want to learn or understand any of the things that we've been able to do. <laughs> You're very brave people. <laughs> We understand that we are very small and, and therefore it's, it has its, its advantages. Yeah. It's difficult to bully us. Yeah. You would be seen as a bully. Yes, sir. Mr. President, have you seen uh, today's time? No, let's have a look. <laughs> the, headlines are it's, the headlines are a bit strong, but the, body, the content of the articles are all right. This one down there. I mean, the war analogy kind of works. I mean, That's but, a good one. I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Just... <laughs> Can I ask how long you've been president? Um, well, it's been seven months now. Seven months in. You had a long struggle to get there. You, I think you said you'd spent some time in jail for your political beliefs. And now you're fighting climate change. You, you do like a battle, don't you? Well, um, it won't be any good to have democracy if we don't have a country. What do you think needs to come out of Copenhagen if, if there's any chance of your country's survival? There has to be a deal um, that satisfies both the developed countries and the developing countries. And your, your language is quite strong on this topic. Aren't well, you? it's a human right. I mean, come on, you know, we cannot not talk about our existence as a country. We've been there for the last 3,000 years. We have a culture, we have a language, we have a civilization. But I feel that it can work. And so therefore, I am hopeful uh, that at Copenhagen, there will be an understanding amicable for everyone. 
And if we, if we can't come up with this understanding, then, you know, God help us. Just in time. <laughs> Dada! Dada! Thanks so much for participating in this. We're well, excited to have you. No, we'll stand right. The idea is to stand right here on the underside of that thing. You've obviously done this before, Mr. President. <laughs> Roll sound. Roll camera. Speed. Marker. Action. If we do not act now... When the camera uh, stops moving, then you can start the, the line of dialogue. Ready? Hold on we one do not act now. Okay, we need it quiet over there, please. Marker. Action. If you do not act now... Could you just take a step this way, Mr. President? Okay, people are almost clear. Okay, turn over, camera. You okay? Oh, here. Yeah. Uh, just, yeah, wait, wait one moment. Uh, roll sound. Marker. If we do not act now... My island nation will be submerged by the rising sea. And cut. Good one. ಮಿಹಾರ <laughs> Thank you very much for this. So this is your first trip to the U.S.? Well, it, it, it is. I have come for a summit of the small island states. 
and also for the United Nations General Assembly. Sometimes in this whole climate change discussion, people find it difficult. You still must get people come up to you and say, Mr. President, it's a job killer if we, uh, if we go, if we try to limit the CO2 that goes into the atmosphere. That's not true at all. It would create more jobs. What is the plan if indeed we can't stop global warming? If we can't stop global warming, it's adaptation. How do we adapt to the new reality? Concrete and embankment to protect these islands. But mind you, you know, it's not just the Maldives. Um, it's hundreds of millions of people. Ultimately, we are talking about New York. Uh, you know, Manhattan is as low as Mali. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted on the 20th anniversary of the formation of the Alliance of Small Island Developing States to welcome you to this historic OSIS summit on climate change. Prime Minister, please uh, be very frank and yeah. tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, um, is this the document that you really thought it would be? Uh, because cost of protection is very crucial for us and it's very, very expensive. Uh, we can't do it ourselves. For instance, in the Maldives, the wall around Mali, our capital city, has cost us $600 million. And that's just one island. Yeah. We have 2,000 islands. So what you're saying, the document should focus more on adaptation? It should focus more on adaptation and it should focus more on renewable energy. It could be a matter of wording, how far um, certain statements could be, could be changed. You know. Okay. No, positive document ka meet hadangare. Okay, green ribbon card document ka hadangare. There must be some time today that we try to insert all that into the document and get it done. I think you know we should uh, kind of shake them up a little bit and say look. This is what actually people, people want. Even if it's not a global deal, can we please have an agreement for us? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It is okay, you know, but we need to um, have an agreement. I, we are hoping that if we can have an agreement among ourselves, um, so that we can speak in one voice, uh, uh, we might be able to achieve better. Mamba, je lui remercie. Thank you. Waka porte parole à tout. Je pense que c'est bien exprimé. Il a parlé à propos de l'Indien Ocean. Merci beaucoup. 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 We try to raise our issue, the points. We all know that no one is going to do anything with this document. I am not. A bunch of small islands with no cloud and anything, and we are coming up with this. Prime Minister, I understand that a lot of people have been working, all the civil servants yes. have been working for two years. I understand. Our people have been doing it. Our people are not agreeing with me either. But if we go with that document, and we will hit the wall in Copenhagen. Where India, China, Brazil, United States, and big emitters, they're not going to go along with that. I think we have a better chance of getting something out of Copenhagen if we try and shift the focus to doing things instead of asking them not to do things. But this is a substantial introduction to the text. That I mean, if you put it's, it on the table, it's not. It's, yes, it's it is. Well, because it's well because in why? Because now, why? please, it's well in line with what is already in uh, the, the arguments in UNFCC. <laughs> it was a wildfire being effort off. Nothing under me, and it was a scare.
if they can go and have this offense. <laughs> The world is increasing its emissions today. This increase could submerge several small island states. But the entire world needs to join in this effort to reduce the spread. If we do not act on time, all of us would become leaders and citizens of failed states. Good morning, Afternoon, ma'am. The recognition that the threat from climate change is serious, it is urgent, and it is growing. Distinguished delegates, yesterday at the AOC's summit, we asked the major emitters to agree to produce enough clean energy to attain the targets of limiting temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius and 350 ppm of carbon concentration. The threats posed to the Maldives from climate change are well known. Weather events will make it harder and harder to govern the country until a point reaches when we must consider abandoning our homeland. We in the Maldives desperately want to believe that one day our words will have an effect. And so we continue to shout them even though deep down we know that you're not really listening. <laughs> You know, there is impending disaster. Everyone knows this now. And then they still um, talk about many, very many other issues, like, you know, for instance, the Arab-Israel conflict. Um, uh, uh, I just feel that what is the point of having a conflict when we are all going to die anyway? It is tiring. It is exhausting. Um, but uh, uh, you go on and on and on and... and um, I have been going on and on and on for quite uh, quite a while. Awan bi hokuts ingo dan na ane mihuri adiptal ke pastros hatharo na amu badalunga divira jek prato dairo ma mitena guys. Ingo dan na ane badalunga vaah kadi dekuma purushatu deifa va hai prato ke tereing divira jevani purste divifa. Alistal ke beenun teri kan mivago tu dunia bodu kama niye kuri ga dua ko es dunia kurmet lan jee panu ba bahu tu ke ei mus mangan na badal tu kun dimawa kangkam bahu tu ke kangkam mihar kuriya bere ma bata fenda mau bete. The president of Maldives made a splash by holding the first underwater cabinet meeting of the world to draw attention to the issue of climate change. The Maldives could become the world's first country of environmental refugees. The U.S. Corals, something unusual was taking place. The president of the Maldives made a call to the world to reduce carbon in the atmosphere to much safer levels. 350 parts per million compared with today's 387. The president says if these reductions aren't made, his whole country risks going underwater. We 
are yeah, trying to right. send them a message, let the world know what will happen to the Maldives if climate change is not checked. This is a challenging situation and we would like to see that people actually do something about it. We would like to appoint you as our advisor on climate change. Um, I'm extremely grateful and thankful for the work that you have done so far, and we hope that we can continue with the work. Thank mm, you very much, absolutely. Mark. Thank you. Delighted. Thank you. I think you should look at the right. cameras. <laughs> you do need to tell me how to do this. It doesn't happen every day. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. We've got. Um, uh, you would have heard Falcon Energy and General Electric uh, working on. Um, a wind farm, hmm. um, and, and they have a yeah. backup gas um, plant. Yes, so wind turbines are happy about. There's absolutely reductions, major reductions. But the point is, burning natural gas, even as a backup, it's still a fossil fuel, and to go properly carbon neutral, you'll have to switch it off in 2019. No, we, 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 don't, we can't choose. We, we are not in that position, hmm. um, and, and we are only, you know, uh, I don't, my feeling is that if we don't take up the wind turbines now with <coughs> them, none of these investors would come to us. Uh, all I mean is that this, the coal carbon neutral thing, you know, your policy is completely riding on this, that there's no sort of subtext to it, that there's nothing which people can expose and say this is a sham or a piece of paper. This is an extremely audacious strategy, and you know, just, just imagine how that could be. You know, you could be there at Copenhagen as the voice of the most vulnerable developing countries in the world. And I, I think this is why the Indians will be not happy about no. the strategy that you've I've mentioned this to India, yeah. that you should not be not happy. That there, you should, you should, um, we are not stopping anything going into India, are we? No, but the Indian strategy is that we have a, a, a God-given right to high carbon development, just as you've had in the US, and if we're going to give up this right, then you'd better pay us a lot of money. And what you've said is, we will give up this right to high carbon development because it's the right thing to do and because we believe in green growth. So, which, but that completely undercuts their position. Un unintended when you had the world's first underwater cabinet meeting. In India, the consensus so far seems to be the onus is on the developed industrialized part of the world to cut down on carbon emissions first. Do you share that as, a, as, a, as an emerging country, as a developing economy? You know, Gandhi once said, an eye, an eye for an eye will make the whole world go blind. And I don't think this is India saying this. We want to see India rise to the occasion and save the world. Uh, and I have no one else to turn to. And I don't believe that anyone else has the moral authority to do that. India has taken on the mighty British Empire empty-handed and have been able to win it, and with it, the, the freedom of the rest of the world. The problem that we find, Excellency, in these negotiations is that somehow or the other, the, there is a there is an impression created uh, that we are the problem. You know, which is rather strange because our per capita emissions are very low. They are one twentieth that of the United States. So why should there be a focus on as if you know it is it is India which is standing in the way? India is not the problem. You see, it, this is the problem. You're taking ownership of India. Now, um, the scientists that you're talking about, the West, who knows all this, they're all Indians. We are not for a moment questioning their judgment. As I said, why don't you join hands together with us to deliver the kind of response that we need? But that response needs to be based on some principle of equity. You cannot say, I will stay where I am because I got here first. And you stay where you are because you are a latecomer. How can I? Can you sell it in your country? No. I cannot sell it in my country. I think. You know, I think if we reduce our emissions from 1.1 tons per capita to 0.5 tons per capita, what the problem is solved? We understand all what India is saying. 
but India needs to come out becoming the champion. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of uh, impact would, would that have on um, the United States government? You know, if, yeah, if but look at the climate bill which is before the Senate. Would you, if, I mean, let us be honest, if you look at that bill, would you come to the conclusion that the United States believes that they, we are near the end of the world? No, they don't. So why is the end of the world only for us? No, I mean, if it's the one world, so... No, <laughs> the, the, yeah, the, the, the thing is, you see, because they don't believe in the end of the world, doesn't I can only control myself. I cannot control the United States. I cannot control Europe. I can only try and pursue it. I cannot send an army to the United States and say, unless you do this or that, you know, we will, we will, we will uh, attack you or do no, that. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt this. We need to get him out as soon. I think just let's stay positive and just like yesterday, nice, uh, nice and slow. Okay. I'll just pass you right. Hello, this is Aslam. Very good talking with us. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, are you very angry? Not really, not angry, but a bit frustrated. What's gone wrong? I mean, we're we're only weeks away from the Copenhagen uh, Environment Summit. You asked me what's gone wrong, but what was ever right? I don't know what was ever right. We've been talking about this for the past uh, uh, decade, and, uh, uh, and, and nothing substantial has, has uh, happened, really. What we really don't want to happen is people going there and coming out and thinking, OK, we've achieved something, and in reality, nothing has, has been achieved. Everybody is to lose with this. So, so yeah, I don't even like the term negotiation with, when we have to deal with climate change, because there is really nothing to negotiate with climate. ಅಂತಾರಾಗೆ <laughs> Hello, very good, Kevin. How are you? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I could really, you know, um, uh, talk to the Indian Prime Minister. And, and I'm fairly confident about India, but um, with China, they don't need an agreement. They don't need any of these things, actually. Um, um, but we do, um, so they can't be spoiling for us. Okay, and uh, please send me that text, and, um, and I'll see you on the 13th, or 14th, rather. I'm not going to go to China. 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 I'm not going to go to China.
मोड़ी दुनिया के एमए कोड़ा दूंगा रुआ में नहीं हूँ ना केलिंग अंगे चंगो चीकी है ना ते आहारों ना अंगे चल दिपुना नो दी ही पांट आने के नेतन कौन सा चाइना में बस इंटरनेशनली में जा कुरा कहीं हूँ नहीं जे ये वहाँ के जी के नहीं हूँ बेनु बेनु वाले के इंटरनेशनल सोवरेंटी दो कल इंटरनेशनल प्रेस का मीडिया इवेंट in solitary confinement but in spite of the odds we refused to give up hope we won our battle for democracy in the mountains a year later there are those who tell us that solving climate change is impossible well i am here to tell you that we refused to give up hope my message to you is continue the protest continue despite the odds and eventually together we will reach that crucial number 
Ja, 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 put in the language peaking year of 2015, which is what we need to achieve 1.5 and 350. The 350 and that are really our two absolutely right, okay, crucial okay. points. We, if you we, can, we need to put that in. Yes. So we've given them the language, mm. so we're trying to make it easy and trying to be absolutely a cooperative party here where they can then use this as the negotiating text from now on. Shall I put you around here and uh, my team this way? We need to have um, 350 somewhere in the uh, draft document, mm. yes. um, but it is not there right now. I think with 113 plus leaders coming, people don't want failure, so <laughs> something has to be pushed forward. President Ashit, we have hundreds of millions of Chinese viewers getting to know Maldives, but are you aware that there are people out there saying that global warming is a conspiracy and certain countries, particularly Maldives, is the number one beneficiary? Of course, um, you know, there are people who doesn't believe that the world is round. There are people who still don't believe that uh, man has landed on moon. So a few skeptics saying these things will not change the reality of any fact. Don't you think that this very particular moment is up for U.S. politicians, statesmen, to decide and determine the final outcome of this uh, conference? Because uh, China has already committed. Uh, uh, what China has committed is not enough to save us. Um, and we would want China to commit more. It's up, not only up to the U.S., it's up to the Chinese as much as the U.S. government. Mr. President, I just want to thank you for what you're doing here. Thank you so much. And I, good luck. Thank you. Okay. I think you could do this. Mr. President, your proposal on the table has been rebuffed by China and India, uh, and scientists at the same time are saying it may already be impossible to keep global temperatures down to 1.5 degrees Celsius because of the carbon that's already in the atmosphere. So could it be counterproductive, this proposal on the table? Uh, well, you know, it's politics and we, are, we, we, we all of us have to be ready to negotiate. Uh, there's a, a lot of discussion about uh, the, what the Maldives might, what options are on the table if this conference doesn't achieve its goals and sea levels rise. What, what are the plans for the Maldives? None. We will all die. Very, very tight. The talks nearly did collapse over and over. There were attempts to change the text to reflect small island states' demands that temperature rises be capped at 1.5 degrees Celsius because the preferred 2 degrees would see them underwater. But China blocked the change. We were hoping that tonight would be a very happy evening. I don't now see that happening. And it's simply madness of China and India not to take it up. It is simply madness. I don't think this has actually anything to do with their capability either. They are quite capable of doing it. They're probably more capable than uh, some of the developed countries to actually do this. Just because uh, the West has pumped so much poisonous gas up into the atmosphere, that doesn't mean that we have to do it again. We can lose many, many battles, but we cannot lose the war. Hundreds of protesters were arrested yesterday. They are demanding a global agreement on reducing greenhouse gases, but they 
may end up disappointed. The talks are not going well. China reportedly saying that it sees no hope for a deal this week. The G77 group of developing countries led a walkout on Monday. Right now, there are a lot of signs that are pointing to the fact that this may not actually happen. And officials who have been directly involved in negotiations, they say it's deadlocked. Now, what I understand is what countries are offering is short of what we are um, expecting. The absolutely crucial thing is that we've lost 350 from the text already. Mm -hmm. And if we sacrifice 350 now, then, then you, you know, we're kissing goodbye to the coral reefs. And if we don't get that language back now, then it's gone probably forever. And by ever, I don't mean the rest of this week. I mean for the rest of this century. <laughs> You know, if we if we kind of you know um, um, uh, relent a little bit on 350 and come out and see how we can have a concrete um, uh, um, um, another clean agreement which moves on to 350 at some point. But, but Mr. President, you 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 don't want you've said and you mean this I presume that you don't want to sign a national suicide note. Uh, we have to consider what that actually means. I mean what the numbers need to be in order not to sign away the future of your country. Let me ask you, if we walk out, do we get it? No. Then I think the, the strong public statements we've made in the past, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, which are you know, uh, you know, the positions that we seek for our survival, that should remain as it is. Yeah, but we need a deal in Copenhagen. We need, uh, we need to come out with a deal. And I feel that Maldives can be instrumental in getting a deal. No, can, no, no, no. Um, um, Sorry, President. You should not lower the, 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 the ambitions on, 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 on one and a half degrees. So what? Degrees because so that, is what, uh, that is what we have now, been saying. Okay, we hold on to this uh, one and a half degrees and 350. And, and what? If we get, come out from here without some form of an understanding, um, I fear that this whole thing can be dragged on and on and on for a very long time without any understanding. From the EU side, they have plans for emission reductions. Yeah. But they're going for 20%. Well, they should go for 30. If they say they're going for 30, this is going to put more pressure on the Chinese. Hello, how are you? Very sorry, I was in the no, front no, door. No, no, it's okay. Thank you very much. If heads of state can come up with a text, uh, I just hope that it can be done. How are you? How are you? Okay, man. We cannot maintain our position and come up with a Ultimately, I think um, um, we would have to make a lot of concessions um, to come out with an agreement. Sure. Um, concessions in terms of mitigation, in terms of adaptation, I don't think we, we should make any kind of concession at all. I agree absolutely. Maybe we say at a maximum two degrees. Yeah. At a maximum. Three fifty, a language, 
This is crunch time. The head of the U.S. delegation says progress is being made, but there is still a long way to go, and time is running out. We are not going to leave Copenhagen with a legally binding agreement. What I'm hoping for is to have an understanding on the core values of these things and then um, have a number of layers and as you peel and one day you will reach that. I mean, China is the only part at these talks that doesn't want to deal, probably. Yeah. It's really between China and the U.S. Even the U.S., this is the first time I've ever been to one of these meetings where the U.S. actually wants a deal. Because Obama can't walk out of here empty-handed. We ha did have another issue we wanted to flag. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The meeting with the Chinese Premier. You know what they're planning to do? What? So you walk in, yeah. you're being very, very intransigent on climate change, and basically stop China's puppet. Yeah. They allow the press to come in. The Chinese Premier says three things. You're not allowed to say anything. The press leave. They lock. Oh, exactly that. Let them do that. Let, uh, I, I will be their puppet. It's better to be their puppet, to seem to be their puppet, than the Americans and Australians and the British. Okay. We have to be seen that we have the reach to China, yeah. that we have the reach to um, everybody. Yeah. Your message is that you're trying to bring the world together to save the talks from collapse by communicating between these different intransigent parties. We need to talk about substance. Absolutely. Now we should come to a conclusion. Because you have to go back to your people, I have to go back to my people. <laughs> From the Chinese yeah. protocol. Yes, that's right. Would you please tell us which one? Um, the Chinese government should be knowing this. Uh, the Grenada Prime Minister is sitting beside my president. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. This the Prime Minister of Grenada. Uh, yes, next to my president. Next, next to the Maldives president, yeah. my president. That's the president of uh, Sudan who is talking. Sudan is on the, no, on the other sorry, side. Sorry, sorry, Maldives. Okay, we have a plan. We're going to win it today. President Nasheed, for BBC News, what do you make of what's happening? I think it's going good. Do you think you will get a deal that, that, that you think is worthwhile? Um, I really need to get out of this place. <laughs> Are we going to have an agreement? I think so. Uh, do you think you've failed, though, on the big question? I don't think we will fail. Watch out. Excuse. Excuse. Ah. The latest is it's changing every minute. Fluid at best, some would say in disarray. The moment President Obama arrived here, he went immediately to an unscheduled meeting with more than 16 world leaders, many here believe, to rescue some sort of agreement. So frantic efforts underway, but still very much in doubt as to what they'll accomplish. Okay, I ask for a little bit of patience. Obviously, we can't determine exactly when that meeting is finishing. We can still see failure, but we need to prepare for success because the chief has been on the inside of this. You know, he's one of about 15 or 15 or 20 heads of world leaders at this point. And a collapse of this talks would be an absolute disaster. It was always going to be difficult to get 192 nations to sign up to a single agreement. 
Some leaders here say these are the toughest negotiations they have ever been involved. Areas of disagreement are as wide as ever. I understand that the meeting has just broken up and has been taking place between about 30 world leaders. And I gather that the real purpose of this meeting is relations between China and the United States. So when do we get to see the text? It'll give a text to Mark. I see the numbers. The 2050 number is here. There's 2050 number. The text is, I think, okay. And it's just that uh, no one agrees on the text. <laughs> no, no, I think that there's, 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 there's a broad agreement uh, among the group now, I think. Right. But there's no agreement with China, so I think we'll have to sign this without China. But the Chinese will not let themselves be isolated, right? They'll have to. No, do they, something. They, they will try to get a block of G77 with them. You know, the whole world thinks that America's blocking this. Yeah, but no. These press is idiots. They've got this 20 year old sort of post colonial mentality. Mm. India is really funny, you know, it's moving from here to here and it, 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 it has no sense of eventually be on, on the right China. side. Isn't India hiding behind China that's going to do the talk? Well, I think initially the idea in India was to be a Canada, mm. to completely hide from everything but and they just. Couldn't. They couldn't. Uh, oh my goodness. No, but I think uh, most people would sign, Bangladesh would sign. They wouldn't. So India is the key one then. Does India, India go with China or does India go India, with everyone else? India goes with Maldives, Bangladesh, Nepal and Peter. Really? Yeah. You know, about half an hour ago we were told there was no deal. Well, yeah. that came from you. Mm. It did. And then, then things turned around. It turns around in every ten minutes. In a heartbeat. Mm. I thought it was just us outside, but it turns out it's inside the room as well. We are now resuming the twelfth meeting of the CMP. Point of order, Mr. President, there is simply no consensus about this document. We're not going to recognize it. We don't want to discuss it. Thank you. Mr. Prime Minister, this document is one of the most disturbing development in the history of the UNFCCC. We do ask you to withdraw this document. Mr. Chairman, this is just one instance when Maldives is asking our friends, our developing country friends, to help us. Please accept this decision and please keep this document alive. We need this document for us to go on. There are many countries who need this document. It has many lifelines. And please, I, I would like to make this plea from the bottom of my heart to my fellow friends from the developing countries to accept this document and to, to adopt this decision. Thank you very much. Mr. President, I just want you to know that Australia will keep trying. We are not going to ignore the pleas of the President of the Maldives. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, as the Prime Minister of Maldives has said, I think an action postponed is not in the interest of people who will be affected by climate change. So we fully back the document that is behind us. On the basis of extensive consultation with parties, I will read out to you a draft decision. The Conference of the Parties decides to take note of the Copenhagen Accord of the 18th of December 2009. I hear no objections, so decided. There was high drama in Copenhagen today, where at the 11th hour, an agreement on global warming was hammered out. The deal done among 25 rich and poor nations, pledging to work together to fight Working climate despite change. despite setbacks, the world leaders reach an agreement on climate change. The agreement calls for a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by all nations. Calls for a reduction, but doesn't require a reduction. And my good friend, Mohammed Nasheed, is actually the hero of tonight. I can tell you this truly because people was blocking that. 
And then Mohammed Nasheed made a very, very strong intervention. And at the very end, we were successful. I don't think there's any, anyone's making any pretenses about this. But uh, this has all been done to try and salvage some kind of, of, of climate, um, um, you know, some kind of climate regime out of this whole process. The, the Chinese wanted to leave here with nothing, and they very nearly got there. But the point of this is that we've still got some process alive. And um, there, were, there were parties in that room who, who, would, who didn't want that to happen. And you know who they are. I understand that this is not the complete binding document, but it has features that it can migrate to become a very good planet-saving document. Mamma, ya Rabbi, wa 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 Rabbi, Ah, that was Nuri Dami. Come down. Eh, ah, Morin, the Kamaiki, a critic at the magazine. Ah, 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 coming back to the mountains, you realize how impossible the whole thing is. We are having to spend less on health care, less on education, and then use that money on concrete and on seawalls. Good morning. But we try to bring change, we try to make a difference. My generation will live on to die on these islands. To see that my grandfather lies peacefully is a wonderful feeling. I definitely don't want to see his grave being washed away. This is us being humans. We have a connection to the past and we have a hope for the future. I don't want my children to lose that. fear for my children's future. I sometimes wish I had not had children, that this is a world not fit to bring them into, really. I'm much more of a pessimist than my husband. He always finds a positive angle to everything, always. We had to bring democracy to the Maldives because I didn't want my children to be in solitary confinement. Neither should they have to be environment refugees. to survive and and we have to do whatever it takes um, to make that real
Now 